Welcome everybody to the skills workshop for the Robotics Roadmap for Australia version 2. Thank you all for joining us and the co-chairs for the skills workshop have put together a really jam-packed program for today so we have a lot of material to go through. Um, my name is Sue Kay and I'm the research director for cyber physical systems with CSIRO's Data61 and were, was one of the architects of the first version of the robotics roadmap. So hopefully many of you will have had the opportunity to go through some of the pre-recorded content. So I won't revisit a lot of that content in terms of the background to the roadmap, but I'll, I'll go through some of the aspects that are um, relevant to the skills workshop that we've organised today. First, I'd just like to acknowledge the um, traditional custodians of the lands, the different lands on which we all meet and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So the first version of the Robotics Roadmap for Australia was released back in June 2018 and was a way to try and get a handle on what the capability uh, Australia already has in robotics and also the way that we are using robotics in different sectors. We very briefly touched on the area of skills but clearly that is an essential component of how Australia is going to adapt to not only robotics but to the increasing pace of technological change um, as, as the world evolves and also to how we can respond to um, global crises like the current COVID-19 situation. So I've highlighted some of the recommendations that came out from the roadmap uh, in 2018 and they're still relevant today. Um, we actually bunched these up. There were 18 recommendations and we um, put those in different bundles depending on whether they were most relevant to industry or to education, government, research and development community or to just in general to the Australian culture. And two of the key recommendations around skills uh, that were identified was the need for industry to be reskilling many Australian workers and also just in general in uh, the education space, how we need to be equipping, equipping all Australians with industry for relevant skills. So these are some of the things that we will be touching on today uh, because I think these are some, some big questions how does an industry or how does an individual company help workers to make a transition so that they can um, ad adapt and adopt many of the skills that are going to be required in our uh, increasingly complex technological future? And look, Australia is in a pretty good space. 30% of our adult population have tertiary qualifications. And 30% of our labour force are employed in occupations that involve science and technology. So from that, you can infer that we have a number of people in the workforce who should be able to adapt to many of these changes quite well. But what about the rest of the workforce? How do we support people in other positions to transition uh, when we're seeing increasing uh, uh, adoption of robotics and automation? And guess what is different about this workshop compared to many of the other roadmap workshops that we have run is that it is relevant to all sectors of the Australian economy. And this diagram might look a little bit complex, but essentially it really is just on the left hand side looking at where Australia invests money and on the right hand side where um, Australia is um, generating revenue. And you can see the division of different sectors there and also the different colours of those sectors is really representing how far advanced many of them are in the, their knowledge and adoption of many of the um, uh, areas like robotics that you know, more broadly could be called cyber physical systems. So for example in manufacturing uh, we know that manufacturers have been exposed to the use of robots for more than 70 years. Our resources and our defence sector are similarly mature in as much as they have got experience with the adoption of robotics in many of their businesses. But in many other areas of the Australian economy, we are seeing that uh, areas are only just starting to experiment with robotics or in many cases are not really using robots at all. 
And it is in particular those sectors which, in my opinion, uh, we are likely to see some of the greatest disruption because when robotics and other new technologies are adopted in those sectors, it's likely to have a significant change. Whereas you could argue for manufacturing, although there are quite a, a range of new and varied robotic technologies that can be applied nowadays, in other respects, um, it's something that manufacturers are um, already conditioned to, I guess, understand and, and work through, although there's always room for improvement in any sector. One of the main findings uh, from the first robotics roadmap, from um, going around and talking to different sectors, is that in some ways the way that we divide groups up into different sectors is a barrier in itself. And so in general, the skills workshop is a exception, but we've divided most of the roadmap workshops up according to sector. And what we often heard was that sectors really wanted to find out what was happening in the other sectors. And perhaps there might be some competitive advantage in finding out what other sectors were doing and seeing best ways that they could adopt new techniques. And I think there's a lot of value in that. And um, I think one of the benefits of having today's workshop will be that we will be getting an insight into how different sectors are currently applying robotics. And hopefully people might get some ideas of how that might be translated back into the areas where they work. And we've had a couple of things happen since the first robotics roadmap was published. One of the things that we also recommended was that if at all possible, we really need to join our resources together. And um, I think it's fair to say that even today, Australia's robotics industry is uh, still um, barely visible, quite fragmented and immature. And one way that you can overcome that is to actually get like-minded companies, uh, education, research providers together uh, so that you can um, uh, work more as a, as a team. And the first step towards doing that has been the development of a Queensland robotics cluster. And we're also hoping that if we can establish how a robotics cluster can work in Queensland, that we might be able to translate that idea into other parts of Australia, because we know that there are many other parts of Australia who, like Queensland, have a strength in robotics. Um, after the roadmap was published, there were also some more economic reports that came out which really identified what some of the drivers for robotics and automation were for the Australian economy. Uh, one of these on the right by Alpha Beta was specifically looking at the uh, mining equipment, technology services, uh, energy and resources sectors. And the Robotics and Automation Advantage for Queensland uh, was commissioned when I was at QUT and really, um, you know, looked at what the economic benefits uh, and also the job creation benefits of applying robotics and automation were specifically to the Queensland economy. But while the results uh, were Queensland specific, I think that they apply to all parts of Australia. The Queensland economy is not so different from any others. But if you do want to get some more information on what some of the potential economic advantages are of robotics and automation, then I recommend that you have a look at um, these reports. And just to give you a bit of a preview of what was in the report around the influence of robotics and automation in Queensland, uh, one of the, this is just some um, very summary information from that, but as you can see, and these are quite conservative estimates, uh, it was thought that adoption of robotics and automation in Queensland over the next 10 years would result in 1.5% per annum growth and additional $77.2 billion in gross state product. And as you can see, 725,000 jobs created um, now, Queensland is already a good creator of new jobs, but that's almost half a million more jobs uh, being created to the state's economy than over the past decade. So um, I think there are a lot of reasons that despite the fact that, you know, we're obviously now facing many challenges from COVID-19, uh, in some ways it probably is a time when there will be even more pressure to adopt robotics and automation so that we can secure sovereign supply chains in many areas. So I think that these figures uh, are probably still um, 
maybe they'd look a bit different, but I think the general trend of it uh, leading to improvements in productivity, but also importantly, the creation of new jobs is important. And that's why the skills workshop is important. What does that mean in terms of how we can best position people to take advantage of the types of new jobs that will be created in the future? And one of the things that came has come out in, I think, most economic assessments of the impacts of robotics and automation and indeed artificial intelligence is that Australia's opportunity to adopt many of these new technologies is time limited. If we delay and we don't adopt many of these technologies, then a lot of the benefits that have been identified as accruing will disappear. So we have the opportunity to take advantage of this now and to help to uh, I guess make our economy more sustainable and to help create jobs. But if we leave it too late, uh, then unfortunately we may not get the same level of benefits. So skills and jobs, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, in the future, these are going to be having to rapidly adapt to change. Uh, one of the important things that we're seeking to do by developing this next version of the roadmap is to help change the narrative around robotics to one of job creation. Most of you are probably familiar with many of the, the uh, headlines or um, unfortunately it seems whenever a robotics story gets into the paper, it's often linked to job loss. And yet most of the economic indicators suggest that uh, that's actually not what's going to happen. I think the, the key thing is that uh, the new jobs that are going to be created will be different jobs. And how we help people to make that transition to the new uh, robot economy is going to be critical in terms of making sure that we don't uh, increase social inequity. Um, so this is why skills, addressing skills is so important. I think one of the other tasks of the roadmap that hopefully we will work towards in this workshop is setting out a vision that people can feel confident in pursuing. Um, you know, people shouldn't feel that making their businesses more technologically advanced is somehow disadvantaging people. Um, and I guess finding ways that uh, people can feel confident that they can pursue some of these solutions and not jeopardise their existing workforce. In fact, to help upskill their workforce is important. And I think it's fair to say that many companies in Australia to date have not been as proactive in supporting their workforce to reskill as they might. There are some notable exceptions. Companies like Rio Tinto have been actively looking at what their workforce of the future needs to be and then actually working in conjunction with groups like TAFE to develop courses that help people to um, uh, you know, change their skill set to be more suitable for the types of jobs in the future. And really, I think we need to, a lot of other companies to be following that leadership model. We can't wait and stand back and hope that somebody else will take responsibility. I think it's um, it, more and more companies will probably find that they have a very loyal workforce if they find ways to help the workforce adapt to the future. And one of the most rewarding things of putting the robotics roadmap together back in 2018 were just some of the fantastic examples that we found of things that Australia was doing that really were world class or world first and being able to start promoting those. And, you know, I really think we were scratching the surface of many of the amazing things that are being done here. And Australians can be rightfully proud of our heritage in robotics and some of the fantastic work that we are doing. So um, these are all some of the reasons why we're now coming together to do our second version of the roadmap. In version two, we're wanting to keep that momentum going um, to encourage the right skills development to help people to make a transition to a, a more robot-defined ro robot, uh, economy. To identify areas where Australia can make a difference, um, and this is not just in the development of skills, but just in uh, development of robotic technology in general. To keep unearthing the um, amazing capability that we have in Australia in this area. Um, Australia is a nation of, of small to medium sized enterprises, and many of them don't necessarily draw a lot of attention to themselves. And I'm constantly surprised by uh, the number of comp new companies that crop up who are doing really interesting things in the space. And obviously we want to establish a, a, a clearly recognised robotics industry in Australia. 
um, so that we can take our own responsibility, I guess, for Australia's um, a future and um, hopefully one a future in which we are adopting technology at a fast rate. Because we had to move all of these workshops online due to COVID-19, we have put out a survey so that if you are unable to um, contribute in other ways, you could help us by completing the survey and having your say uh, in the contents of the next version of the roadmap. So uh, please uh, contribute if you can. And I'd like to thank my co-chairs. They've really put a lot of work into putting this workshop together. Jackie French and Reza Ryan from TAFE, uh, Preti Pretachandra from Central Queensland University, William Pagnon from Freelance Robotics, uh, and there are quite a number of other people who have been helping in putting, putting this together. And one of the principal people who has helped to put this together, who will be taking us through to the next session of the workshop, is Amanda White, who is the General Manager of Freelance Robotics and has put a fantastic panel together for us today. And I will hand over to Amanda to introduce us to that panel. Thank you, Amanda. Good afternoon. Thank you, Sue, for such a clear introduction to the topic at hand. My name is Amanda from Freelance Robotics in Brisbane, and I'm here to facilitate the Skills Sector Industry Panel as we prepare for the second version of the Robotics Roadmap for Australia. Now, this is the inaugural panel for skills and industry. The nature of jobs is changing, and as we shift towards an automated workplace with an increase in robotics and advanced technology, these changes are leading to a skills gap. Our existing workforce, who are used to doing things a certain way, will find it difficult to manage the change without further training and education. Meanwhile, those entering the workforce need to seek out different educational paths to arm them with the skills needed for jobs that are not what they used to be. So let's meet our panel. Uh, they're here to discuss the needs of industry. And I'm going to start with welcoming Robert Petherbridge. He's the Executive Director at TAFE Queensland, as well as a leading member of the Future Skills Group. Robert is well recognised in the education sector with expertise covering strategy, business development, stakeholder engagement, program management, as well as leading diverse geographically dispersed teams. And uh, we also have Corey Stewart, who is here as part of our manufacturing delegation. Corey Stewart spearheaded the Arm Hub initiative, leveraging Queensland's global leadership in advanced robotics and design-led manufacturing to create this not-for-profit company with its big mission to accelerate the uptake of advanced manufacturing in Australia. The other half of our manufacturing sector delegation today is Tim Morgan, who is the group plant manager for our favourite biscuits, Arnott's. And I understand this plant manager role covers both the Queensland and the South Australian districts. So Tim is very well known in the food processing industry, having also had roles with the Campbell Soup Company in Australia and in the United States. So welcome to Tim and Corey. Next, uh, let's welcome Leonie Mulheron. She's the National Business Development Manager at Lansom Concepts. Leonie is experienced as a business development manager, having worked in the medical device industry, and she specialises in the field of robotics so if you don't know, Lampson is an Australian-owned company providing advanced material handling, including an automatic guided vehicle system introduced into Australian healthcare back in 2010. So that's 10 years of really very established work inside of robotics and industry delivery. So those are some great projects, Leonie. And uh, our next panellist is from uh, the global leaders in technology, Airbus. So representing the aerospace industry, let's all say hello to Scott White. Scott has the role of industry and innovation manager within the strategy and business development team at Airbus in the Australia Pacific. And representing government today is a regional director from the Department of Small Business and Training with the Queensland government, Brett Hagsma. So Despot works with employers, small business individuals to support their career and business aspirations. So thanks for making the time to be here today, Brett. Uh, let's also welcome our hospitality panel delegate, Pat Dennis, the Director of the Tourism, Hospitality and Personal Services 
for TAFE Queensland in the Brisbane region. Now, Pat is also the product sponsor, so he's responsible for consistent delivery of TAFE Queensland training and assessment for tourism, hospitality, baking and sport, recreation and fitness. I understand that Pat was, Pat was also originally a pastry chef. And uh, let's also finally welcome Brett Dale. So Brett is the Group Chief Executive of the Motor Trades Association of Queensland, and you might know this group as MTAC, and here he represents the services sector. So Brett has a strong history of working across health, logistics, education, training, workforce development, innovation and business advocacy, as well as support for small to medium enterprise businesses. So welcome everyone. We have 60 minutes of set Q&A, so I'm just going to set my timer to start now. And then the panel will be using our remaining time to field questions from workshop registrants who I see are currently very active on the Miro board. And if you have any questions for the panel, please add your questions to the WebEx chat function. Our co-chair, Jackie French, is ready to start collating them. So you can start adding your questions to the WebEx chat function anytime from now. Great. So let's get started with the first question. Um, Corey Stewart, I'm going to field this one to you. When it comes to the robot economy, how ready is your industry's workforce? Um, that's a great way to talk to because uh, we have projects we work with on a kind of project to project basis and what we're finding um, is that the workforce is generally, you know, very nervous about the outset, um, about how it's going to impact their individual jobs. Of course, um, the business owners are a bit nervous about what they're going to do, particularly in the small to medium enterprises. But the, but the action of actually pursuing the, um, you know, uh, industry four applications, whether and particularly robotics, has tended to. Um, always turn into a, a, a very positive story around um, employers um, getting new skills, starting to use the robotics to, to you know, take out the, you know, the parts of the job that they, they haven't liked um, and learning to maintain and, and uh, program the robots themselves. And a lot of the workforces, it's been a case of, you know, when do I get my robot as they see other people in the workflow operations sort of um, get aspects of their jobs um, automated. Uh, so it's been a case of um, people being able to do work, a higher value work, um, take out the dirty, the dull and the dangerous, as um, many say, and also then be able to do novel projects um, and, you know, take a new business case back to to the business owners and say, well, because I can automate this now, we can now take on a certain project or we can now do something at a certain scale or price point that we couldn't before. So we have also been engaged, like we do robotics and often AR and VR in combination in terms of developing digital workflow um, and other aspects of, um, you know, uh, manufacturing, you know, workflow and this, Together, these parts have been a kind of steamrolling effect. So what I guess I'm saying is it's for us, it's been a very important um, fact that going one on one with a company, particularly because we work a lot with small to medium businesses um, and working with their workforce who are experts in their job. So helping them augment their job, um, do their job better um, has really had hands on transformation. So it has also filled a bit of a gap where there haven't necessarily been the, the courses available just to step into this sort of training. Um, and in some cases, it's then inspired key workers to go and get further training um, or formalise their experience. So they're taking more proposals for training back to their employers saying, you know, great, if I could um, sculpt in AR and VR and I can send that directly to the digital workflow of, of the robot, well, um, that's terrific. Now, what do I need to learn how to do, you know, engineering assessment digitally or, or whatever it is that is actually um, upskilling them to do that job. So that's that's been my general experience.
Amanda, you're on mute. Oh, am I? Uh, can you hear me? How's that going? Yes, that's better. Thank you. Oh, okay. I was just saying, Corey, you know, you come from an industry where there's such a long standing relationship with the automation actually on the shop floor. And it's really amazing to see technology advancing because what automation looked like in the 1970s or the 1980s compared to these technology shifts that we're talking in VR and AR is just fascinating. You know, um, Scott, Scott White from Airbus, if I can throw it across to you, because I know that um, aerospace is certainly very invested in automation, but maybe not as much as manufacturing. What do you think when it comes to the robot economy? How ready is your workforce? Thanks for the question, Amanda. I mean, it's, a, it's a interesting one because I guess there's a number of different layers to the aerospace industry in different sectors and subsectors. And if we are talking about the, you know, within Australia, then typically we've got the commercial airline, we've got the defence sector, we've got, uh, you know, uh, civil aircraft industry. There's a number of different sort of levels to it. Uh, and one of the great things about the Australian aerospace industry, we do have a very highly skilled workforce. So there is, a, a, I guess, a lot of knowledge that's already there. They re readily adapt new technology. Mm. Um, but the great thing is, I think it, it's never in the, in necessarily in the context of new technology replacing people uh, outrightly, because there's a lot of the work we do, particularly in the manufacture, uh, the maintenance repair overhaul area, is relying on people being able to turn a spanner, to put it colloquially. So there's mm. a lot of that work still has to be done by the, you know, the human workforce. Uh, but, but how do we actually expand the capability of what the aerospace industry does? And that's where we're seeing the advancements in drones, where we're seeing the use of big data and how can we now analyse data that we could never analyse before? Um, you know, and to do it, it wasn't, just, wasn't practical to do it with, with humans. So a lot of the advancements we're seeing is actually increasing our ability to do things that we haven't been able to do before. And hence why robotics, AI, um, machine learning, uh, it's taking us to areas where we've never been before. So, but the other challenge we have is within the aerospace, we have assets that typically are 10, 20, 30, 40 years old. Yes. So while we've got the new generation of technology and we're educating people about the advancement, we still need, need to maintain a workforce that can work with the current or previous generation technology. And you often find that as a gap. And that's what certainly pre-COVID the challenge we had was not so much um, a lack of skills necessarily, it was a lack of people with skills. So we actually had you know, a shortage of people and hence why a lot of efforts going into by the federal and state government and the industry as a whole, a lot of, not just Airbus, but also a lot of uh, the players in, in the aerospace industry are investing a lot of time and effort into STEM programs to encourage more students into, into the field of STEM and industry 4.0 type technology for that, for that shortfall. Mm, you know, you've raised a really interesting point there, Scott, which is that COVID has changed the way in which businesses are operating substantially. And I think that's true at all uh, sizes of business, whether it's a global business right down to the small to medium enterprise. Um, Leonie Mulheron, if I can ask you, Given that we're in this period of so much change, what new skills do you think are needed most in your industry and why would that be the case? Look, in every healthcare um, business, whether it's hospitals, whether it's aged care, the, um, the, the, the staff shortages are an issue. And for the staff in these organisations, they do need help with automation and, and robotics to do their job so they can have more face-to-face -face time. And, and I guess from an education perspective, looking at what they actually uh, need to get to this next level that we're looking for is quite varied depending on the product that they're actually using, whether it's a front of house product, whether it's actually within the public arena, um, whether it's in the surgical uh, robotics as well, because they get a lot of support from the manufacturers in the surgical arena. But when it comes to those and used in public and used in, in the operational side, there, there is a fairly big um, gap in what uh, people's understanding of how robots work. Mm -hmm. So there's, there actually is a lot of support needed on the floor to, to maintain the robots in a functioning order. So I think when we look at um, the, 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 the basic level of robotics understanding that there needs to be some really good foundation work done in the healthcare sector. 
I know in the aged care, you know, they wouldn't have dreamt of having robots, you know, four or five years ago. Um, mm. But they actually incredibly are, ah, the adaption they've had is they've been very agile. And for a lot of people, they would have thought it was just a dream five years ago. But for the ones actually using it, they've actually adapted very, very well with the right support. So I think there's a mm. ground people using it are incredibly agile, but the actual big change in education needs to be at a CEO level and an understanding of the business right from the top of a hospital, right through from the top of an aged care group. That's where the actual current understanding of robotics is quite low. So I think we need to focus on some of the higher level decision making um, to be able to get that knowledge to another level. It's really true what you're saying there, Leonie. You know, different approaches aren't necessarily possible inside of a single industry, but people have different attitudes. And so what does that mean in terms of who's funding operations versus who's using operations? And it's not unusual to find that when we're looking at upskilling, that person actually on the ground using the technology has a fairly clear idea of where their skill base is, but their understanding may not necessarily translate to the point of the person who would be investing in their skills development. And I think that's not just an issue inside of your sector, but probably generally true. Um, just very quickly, inside of your sector, is there, to your knowledge, anyone using things like apps to get a baseline of whether people have the skills required to use the technology or what their skills might be that they would be looking to develop through training? Look, at this stage, um, the training um, that I've seen for robotics has been very simple videos and very, very basic um, uh, bits and pieces of, of training from all different integrators at different levels. So um, the apps, they actually are using apps to use the actual robots themselves, but there's actually no simple form for, um, except for very, very small snip videos that are actually used on the actual tablets that I've seen. Yeah, I think that's very common what you're saying. Um, Brett Dale, Brett Dale, if I can throw this one over to you, because you're over in um, obviously a very specific industry which is related to motor and vehicular use. What new skills do you think are needed and why in your sector? Do we have Brett Dale? Yeah, I think Brett's on mute though. Oh. That's okay, we'll give him a moment. Hi, Brett. How are you? How's that going? Is that Perfect, yeah. Sorry, have a great statement you missed. <laughs> <laughs> so I was saying we're very fortunate as a um, an industry that's had emerging technology. So if you think of the cars that you drive and how different they are from 10 to 15 years ago, mm. and as a result, our workforce has responded to all things automation. Um, and I think there's there's been great progress in that space. I think what is missing them. And if you think about our industry in automotive, we have no onshore manufacturing. Um, and at the highest level, I think there is need for a huge um, cultural shift in mindset about our capacity. Um, and I think COVID-19 um, taught us that, you know, the dependency we have offshore on supply chains is not a good practice. Now, technology and robots can enable us to do things that we weren't competitive with. Um, some years back. And I think that's the challenge for my industry, is having the faith to bring that back onshore and become, um, you know, the, the, the users of the technology such as robots that can build lots of things that we were not competitive for previously. But as far as our workforce going in maintaining these technology um, products, such as, you know, uh, could be remote machinery out on farms with we're working with telematics that can go back to um, the country of origin or manufacturing that comes back to a local manufacturer to tell them that a repair is required. That seems to be working exceptionally well and we embrace that and we learn as we go through manufacturing training. But I think we're missing opportunities and that's what mm. the challenge is for our industry. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And, you know, the idea of supply chain disruption has had a massive downflow effect. I'm hoping from my perspective that we're going to see on the other side of this crisis a major reinvestment in the way in which we do business inside of Australia, uh, all the way from the manufacturer down to the service user. And when it comes to the sort of you know, vehicle operations, like you said, you know, there's a massive difference in the way in which you know a vehicle being run now works compared to how a vehicle ran 
uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And clearly there's a skills gap just sitting there in terms of our local workforce being able to best utilise the technology. And not just the technology that's being rolled out right now, but I can imagine in cars there's going to be a huge transition over the course of the next 5, 10, 20 years as we see different types of technology integrated into everyday vehicle use. Absolutely, and that will have a whole of society impact. And we, you know, and I think the challenge for government is to introduce these trials and real technology that exists, and then we need to invest in Australia to be the creator of that technology rather than the recipient. Yeah, I like that point. To be the creator of the technology rather than the recipient is a really, really good point. Um, I'm going to throw this across now to Brett. Um, sorry, to Pat Dennis. Um, just off that back end point, because you know when we're talking about investment. Pat, you know, training comes in many forms, traditional university courses, vocational education, technical apprenticeships. And so, you know, there's also these newly emerging micro-credentials. Um, what would suit, do you think, industry best and why? Particularly when we're talking about this idea that new technology is emerging and we need to sort of grasp onto the cutting edge for our workforce to be most effective. Thanks, Amanda. Well, for hospitality, um, there would be a need for ongoing training. Uh, as Sue pointed out, well, there might be 37% uh, of people that have a degree or higher. The hospitality industry doesn't have that level of education. And it's quite often a gateway industry um, straight out of school for younger workers. So there will be there's, there will be an ongoing need for training. And in the short term, it would be at a micro-credential short course level because you know, as technology comes in um, and robotics come into this industry, there's going to be a need for just-in-time training. Um, and it was mentioned before, I think, by Leone around how robots work. So what was being talked about in the aged care industry, I could see happening in our industry as well for the need for change. Mm. Yeah, th there certainly is, isn't there? And, you know, Tim, Morgan, if I could have your opinion on this as well, uh, I know that, you know, from your perspective, certainly there's a lot of interest in the way in which we're rolling out training. What do you think about what Pat just had to say? Yeah, so for, for us in, uh, in the food manufacture, uh, I guess one of the challenges we have with regards to training is uh, training people with, with courses, but then getting the application and the practice in the workplace consistently yeah. enough that they retain the skills. And so... Uh, short online courses, we think, are the way to go. Where the learner, the learner can do the training that's applicable to the to the type of skills that they need for their specific for their specific workplace, so that they can use them frequently. Because we do, yeah. we have invested uh, in training courses that individuals have you have have gone on, but then they don't use the skills, and then six months later, you need that skill, and you ask them to go do it, and they, and obviously because they haven't practiced, uh, it's it's really a, a forgotten skill already. Yeah. Uh, and certainly in, in, in big, large manufacturing, that's a, that's a challenge that we need to overcome. So short online courses that are, are learner-led, uh, specific to the environment or the tasks that that, that that person's working with or the type of automation they're working with are, are probably most applicable in our industry. And so when we throw that back to Pat, you know, when we're talking about training opportunity and reinforcement of learning, you know, Pat, what do you think for the average worker inside of your industry do they have the ability to apply what they would learn from vocational education versus maybe a university course or getting on board with micro-credentials? For now or, in the or for what's coming in the future? Uh, at the moment, most I'm, I'm particularly interested in what's happening right now. Yeah. Uh, what's happening in the future is also a really good point. Yeah, well, I mean, for what's happening now, I, I think the training's meeting the market needs. Uh, if you look at the robotics roadmap, however, and identify that within that industry, there's there's a bit of exploring going on and there is. Um, and so adoption is coming in the future. I would say that what's being trained now wouldn't prepare somebody for potentially what they may be needing to possess in skills and knowledge in 10 to 15 years time. But then that goes to another presentation that was uh, linked to the web page on this seminar around lifelong learning. And that's a whole other discussion of, of, of how you actually engage a workforce to become lifelong learners. Yes. Yeah, look, 
Pat, I can't underscore that enough. You know, we've got uh, a large workforce that are invested in their jobs, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're invested in career development or education around that job. You know, the development of skills and lifelong learning, you know, on the other side of the technology that we're bringing to play, I'm hoping that that marriage will be a lot clearer for people and that the youth that we have training now will have a lot more career direction in terms of that investment in lifelong learning. Um, Tim Morgan, I know that you have some good examples of what's happening right now with BHP Mitsubishi Alliance. Can you just outline that for us in some more detail because I'm particularly interested in how they're utilising um, the different types of training to reskill for Industry 4.0. Sorry, Amanda, that's probably not uh, not me. Uh, that oh, Robert, my, my bad. I'm sorry, Robert Petherich. <laughs> Robert, are you there? That question was for you. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's okay. I was I was going to be very interested in what Arnott's are doing. I'm sure that the uh, I'm sure that the workforce would would, would love it if that was the case. Um, <laughs> so um, you mentioned. Um, sorry, I should say that Sue mentioned in the introduction the work that's been done in the West with Rio Tinto and um, the South Metro WA tape there, um, which was, you know, has been a great bit of work and we're picking that up and working with BHP Mitsubishi Alliance to develop a set of skill sets, micro-credentials and qualifications that go to supporting the implementation of autonomous operations, but more broadly industry 4.0. And probably relevant to the discussion that um, we were just having it's actually multifaceted. So we've ended up in from the scoping exercise that we're at a point now that we're about to proceed um, with 10 different micro credentials, 12 different skill sets and two qualifications. And that reflects the need to create new employment pathways from school into entry level jobs. But it also re represents the need to work with the existing workforce and upskill the existing workers. So as jobs change and the new technology comes in, Workers can either adapt to that technology and you know bring it in, into their jobs or add it to their existing jobs, or in the instance where jobs are totally redesigned, create new roles and create pathways between existing roles and new roles. So that's really the work that we've been doing. Some of the really interesting things that have come out of that work um, have been less about you know the actual automation, um, but it's been more about the cyber physical systems ensuring um, the security and reliability of those. And then um, also looking at the maintenance side as well, the technical maintenance side and the different skills, um, such, you know, different skills that are required to work on different sorts of equipment, including you know, hybrid, diesel, electric, those sorts of things. So it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a really good bit of work, Amanda. Yeah, it sounds like it's been a massive investment in terms of really looking at what the workforce needs is and then coordinating a training package that's going to have outcomes. And when it comes to looking forward with what could be available for upskilling, these sorts of models, I think, will be very informative with regards to the results that are gained. Um, you know, BHB and Mitsubishi, I think, are possibly putting forward something that's very interesting in terms of an industry-specific training package. Um, you know, actually, uh, Brett Hagsma, if I could throw this across to you, um, how does the government, so Desbit in particular, identify and fund training and skilling needs for an industry? Thanks, Amanda. Appreciate that one. Um, Desbit has a, a multifaceted role there. We, we operate at very different levels in how we get that information. Um, so at, at the very top end, you'd be looking at things like Jobs Queensland, who provide a strategic advice into the government, and they're very much focused on future skills needs um, and workforce planning and development. You've then got um, ministerial skills roundtables that give opportunity for stakeholders to contact direct with the minister. Um, senior leaders from industry and government meet regularly. Um, in one of the video presentations, uh, Shay Chalmers touches on the reference group that she is part of, mm. and um, you know gives gives information to government and to Desbit in that case. Um, Desbit's also put together some localised responses to that as well. Regional jobs committees to bring together local stakeholders and look at what training and investment needs to be made to address specific workforce issues. Um, there's one in the Redlands, which sits in my area, which is great. So it's led by the local Chamber of Commerce. 
Um, and we've also got industry um, advisory arrangements through industry skills advisors. They provide information to the department. So mm -hmm. we've got a lot of different linkages there to provide us with the information because to touch on something Corey said earlier on, the experts are in their jobs. The experts aren't necessarily sitting in the chair I'm sitting in. I don't know a lot about robotics personally. So to set up training, you need those experts and getting that voice of industry. And that's that's always been a challenge for government and one that we continue to work on, but we really do need that industry input. And that's why I'm, I'm um, pleased to have the opportunity today to be part of this, to pick up some of that industry advice, to yes. look at where we need to go. Um, you know, we've we've moved a long way from where we funded trade-based apprenticeships and trade training. That was that was what government funded. When we start conversations now around micro credentials and skill sets, of common nature, and we're looking at the mm -hmm. different micro micro credentials that are out there, I think that's a magnificent step forward, and that's been based on the needs of industry to look at those little pieces that can be put together to help people in their jobs. So. Mm -hmm. um, and just one other quick point on that, because a couple of other the presenters have made it, the understanding from the top down, you know, the, the management needs to understand their workforce <coughs> and their business to truly be able to put in place good training solutions. Mm. Um, you know, they need to understand the point was made around the new and old technology, you know, it's, uh, the need to actually integrate that training across the workplace. So for us, um, yeah, we rely on that voice of industry and getting out as much as we can into into industry and working with yeah, regional jobs committees, um, regional skills investment strategies, such as Amanda, you, you represent a committee in the Redlands area for that one, to get that information to be able to feed into the investment area and the design people who design the programs. So yeah. hopefully and that covered it for you. Yeah, I think that it's, fundamental to this whole process succeeding in terms of upskilling a workforce that we can coordinate all of the stakeholders really effectively. And, you know, Corey Stewart, I know ArmHub represents a new type of stakeholder for manufacturing. Uh, I'm going to throw back to you at this point because I'm, I'm curious from your point of view, what is the general mood in manufacturing regarding job displacement? So when we set up the Arm Hub, we did a, quite a comprehensive uh, feasibility study, mostly in Queensland, but also had kind of touch points across other states. Um, uh, and what we really found out um, is that uh, companies, and we, our target audience was in the main SMEs um, and then a few larger businesses. So just with that sort of um, overview, we found out that businesses, manufacturers specifically know they need to adopt Industry 4. Um, the question was really, how do I do it? Um, who can do it with me? What's the? Where can I go for the advice? Who can I trust? They're very concerned about getting locked into software models. Um, yeah, so that's a good point. <laughs> a great nervousness around. Look, I'll just be honest. A great nervousness about not knowing how to talk about what they don't know, um, mm -hmm. and this is sort of one of the reasons that the Arm Hub has come into being to try and be a kind of trusted conduit of information and um, resources that can build in and out from the manufacturing space. So um, that's that's what we know. So I don't think it's about um, a thought that uh, that they could continue business as usual. They thought digital is disruption. They had to be at the front of it, other that otherwise they wouldn't. They would really be. Um, irrelevant so there was a great anxiety around that so I think what, uh, what the opportunity then is is to think about what do they need to um, take on you know mm. uh, industry for and like I said uh, in a day-to-day -day experience for us here in the hub and, and the partnerships that we're building even though we're a university and we do R&D and applied R&D it's really they need to be able to see it what we what we sort of coined the phrase here is like drop it on their foot um be able to see other companies apply it so yes. companies that um you know they come in and they see what what they're doing and how they're doing it and collaboration between companies and then they go oh this is how i can apply it or oh, you've already done that it at that point i suppose when they've got that entry point 
we find that then they are, then they just sort of starting their journey. And if they think about it like a journey, um, becoming kind of industry four ready or um, enabled, it's kind of the sense is it doesn't ever end. It's just, where am I at on that journey? And I do have a plan going forward. Um, and they're not totally consumed by, I guess, the, uh, the sense that it's just undoable. So they're taking a part of their business, hopefully a strategic part, so we also do a little, um, an overview of um, a business as an assessment tool with companies um, through our collaboration with the IMCRC um, or Future Map, and that helps them sort of get an overview. They can start making some decisions. They can do it on their own in the first instance. Um, they can also then seek advice um, against any of the people that we can um, direct them to, and then they often come back because they have a problem that they know they're ready to solve. And move forward but that you know it typically takes at least six months by that time that kind of loop has gone around that's for the smaller companies but often the bigger companies have a very similar um path in their, their, their work with us you know you know it strikes me as you were talking that there's so much energy that goes into this concept of of lifelong learning and the transition from our current education models but it's really true that industries as a whole require the support to transition also into this idea of lifelong learning. You just mentioned, you know, that business owners are kind of becoming more agile, that they're reviewing what they do and it's becoming part of their business process, that what happens now isn't just the model that they're going to keep for the coming, you know, decade, two decades. It's a realisation that actually now for training to be effective, the businesses also need to do it differently. They're also in the process of major change management and the support levels provided through a cluster really is something that is so important to be able to provide that different level of agency for business owners who are already often very time poor um, and also not necessarily planning for that change. Yeah. And when you get businesses of such great variety looking at each other um, kind of sparks go off, you know, companies that maybe only hire megatronics engineers and they're a steel company because they just know the future is um, yeah. having highly skilled people do everything because what they'll think of doing on the floor mm. one put them into the future and they're, they're getting the benefits that way right through to having, you know, really highly skilled um, sort of um, really large, I suppose, highly skilled labour workforces that, you know, can go through that transition um, I, I've seen it work both ways, but it's usually built on a sort of sense of trust and, and getting a, bit, a plan together and it's, and it's being able to really look at what other people are doing and sharing and mm. collaborating, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Tim, this is a really good point for you actually because here you are sitting inside of, of a massive exercise which is, you know, food processing at an enormous national scale, international scale. How are you finding in terms of the the day-to-day -day user of the facility, so your average worker on the floor, are they managing the change, do you think, effectively? What sort of supports are in place to help them as they need to change the sort of work that they're doing? Yeah, great question, Amanda. I think uh, for, for our, our experience, uh, certainly when we're bringing in automation or change, that's familiar. So typically we've been upgrading our packaging technology on a regular basis uh, and it's and it's definitely, as it's evolved over the last 20 years, in particular the speed of change has increased and the type of gear that we're bringing in. But the employees mm -hmm. who work in that space are familiar with that change and they expect it to happen every couple of years. Uh, and so when that technology comes, they see it as just another piece of kit that they need to learn and adapt to. And so that's quite right. familiar yeah. and I'd say it's a close in change. Where, yeah. we, where, we see, uh, where we see challenges, though, is when we bring in, uh, I guess, first edition or, or brand new technology into our environment. So recently we did a, an AGV uh, installation into our Brisbane uh, factory here. So we have 650 people in this facility. Uh, we introduced AGVs into the packaging area where they actually were moving around within our workplace, not in our packaging store, but actually in the, in the factory environment. That one took a little bit of work and uh, a large amount of consultation and also a, a lot of a lot of training and development within how do we move people around, how do we get the AGVs to operate effectively and, and mm. how people were involved in that. But that took a, that, that change being the first time we've done anything quite like that new technology 
people were very suspicious, uh, and 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 uh, and we had a had a lot of barriers to overcome. So it just depends on what technology you're playing with and in, in which, which space for us. Oh, yeah, and you know that that was just brilliant because there's so much different types of technology to include, and this idea of resilience. You know, at the beginning, people might be a little bit um, technology shy, if you like, having to learn a new system. But then there's this idea that it becomes habitual and they become interested. And in, in, as they gain expertise, I imagine there's a lot of translatable skills just sitting here. You know, the Arnott's factory, you know, is a very well-known factory in terms of the skill set of its workers and the level of technology that's been put in place. So kudos to you because I think that's really important what you've just said. And I think from an industry perspective, getting training that works on the floor is really going to be the big factor in terms of success. Going back to this idea of having a better supply chain, having a better way of investing in you know, Australian workers and getting our workforce skills ready, it's these kinds of applied examples that are making a massive difference. When Corey was mentioning looking towards other successful businesses who've implemented, I think Arnott's can really stand out exactly from what you've been saying in terms of the ability of the workforce, the resilience and the, the characteristics of training that have led to excellent outcomes. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Look, I'm, I'm going to change the topic um, because I'm just getting a bit aware of our time. Um, and I want to talk success stories. You know, when we're integrating new technology to the workforce, I mean, Tim just had some really great points about doing it better and being more effective. Um, but Leonie, I'd really like to hear from you because, you know, you're working with a company that has a, a good period now of rolling robotics out into a different kind of sector. Can you tell me your best staff success story? Yeah, um, it's a it's really quite interesting. I, I, I see the staff as well as the, the customer, whether it be a patient or a resident, actually a part of that success story because mm -hmm. um, the robots are there for obviously to support staff and, and their the responses we've had for say care staff or nursing staff when having to work yes. alongside robots. Um, some of their responses in those first, you know, I guess for us, you know, we, we did worry about their response because residents actually and patients actually accept robots quicker than staff do. Mm -hmm. um, and in that first week um, of using those robots and, and, and we, start to, we start to see them obviously be quite agile and, and use them and not have any of that fear. A couple of months after installing in one of our first facilities in the world, which is an aged care facility in Brisbane, Prince Willem, and the staff, one of the staff members pulled me aside and just said to me, you know what, um, I am no longer scared of actually uh, pushing a trolley and knocking a resident over and breaking their hip. And I no longer had that fear every day when I'm, when I'm transporting a trolley. I actually now am so glad the robots are doing that for me. And then I had um, same, same facility um, and other facilities have come to me and said that they're no longer as tired as what they are when they go home at the end of the day. They're not as tired anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And with range working, uh, the work, average age of a worker in aged care is in the mid 50s. So we start to look at the the staff in a facility like that to keep them there um, and to be doing better, uh, more care based activities. Um, but from a um, uh, not stressing about pushing trolleys, they have actually confidence that the product is working. Um, and I guess, you know, it, they actually do say, I'm so glad it didn't take my job because then now I'm actually enjoying my job more. So we're getting some really great feedback, which is really exciting for the industry and I think very encouraging. Yeah, that's a huge success story. You know, I'm really enjoying every time I hear someone tell me that they had a better day at work because automation and robotics was part of their work day. There's so much, I think, misconception often put around about fear regarding introduction of robotics and automation into the workplace. But when it comes down to it, the lived experience so often says that it was a successful integration. And um, Scott, Scott White, while we're on the point, I'd love to hear your best staff success story as well. Yeah, sure. So this, this one actually doesn't involve robotics, but a parallel um, uh, industry 4.0, so AR, VR. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so, so we've got a team that uh, basically start off with a couple of people and now it's um, about seven people. And uh, the capability that this team provides originated out of an innovation day. So we had an in, in, our internal innovation day in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, this team didn't come first, actually, they came second. Uh, and they put forward a concept that was developed pretty much overnight. 
from that, there's now developed that it's been shown at uh, air shows, they're exporting um, similar sort of products uh, back to our parent company in support of overseas work. And, and what it creates is this immersive experience. So instead of actually sending an aircraft to the Avalon Air Show last year at a you know, huge cost, we were able to present it all in AR, VR. So potential customers could be immersed and experience it um, and swap configurations in a matter of seconds, which would normally take hours, if not days, to change the configuration. Oh, that's impressive. And then, so that was obviously more of a marketing customer engagement activity, but now we've also rolled it out as part of our engineering process. So they had one task, which on the engineering schedule would have taken three months of mock-ups, engineering design work, engaging with a customer. Using AR, VR, that was reduced to one week. And Incredible. the interesting thing is a lot of people are often skeptical. People who have an experience go, oh, like, I don't believe the technology. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. Okay, put the, the headset on, experience this, and then it's hard to get actually get the headset off and they want to stay using it because they really see the value and the benefit. And, and the same was with this customer, you know, in terms of they want to have their equipment in the back of a helicopter and want to see the best layer. So thinking mm -hmm. traditional, build a mock-up, build a, you know, a real-world model so we can manoeuvre around it. And we yeah. said, no, we can do better than that. We'll create it all in the virtual world. Um, obviously, they're still sceptical. They tried it. And then uh, in the reporting of it in, over the next few weeks, they go, no, let's, let's go back to the AR, VR world so we can talk it through. So, <laughs> That's so really told, not... I'm that person. I'm the person who wants to keep the goggles on. It's true. <laughs> yeah. So, and that, uh, that team won an Airbus Helicopters Award for Innovation. So I went with a few of the team members to Germany last year where they received a top 10 award. Uh, and and so that team's now grown to seven. And, uh, you know, it, um, it's one of those things. It's an organic growth. And the challenge, too, was, you know, getting it through the traditional approval process and justifying it when here's innovation. You know, and really challenged the way we had to think about how do we not only support a, a, a bottoms-up approach, but how do we be reactive and support innovation? Um, you know, in, in our old mindset of budgets and approval process and business cases and, and so mm. forth. So, so that, that seems as soon as we have something that can use AR VR, we're, we're taking our customer there, we're taking our visitors there, and it just sells itself to over and over and over again. Yeah, and what an amazing success story for that team. That, that's very impressive. And it just goes to show that when you have some disruptive technology and you can move into a new space, I love this idea of blue ocean, red ocean. You know, the red ocean is, is overused and suddenly you can move into a blue ocean where everything is available. And you can have some new piece of technology sometimes quite rapidly considered that becomes so viable and really a useful and fun add to the outcomes of a business. Um, when it comes down to it, it's true that old business models are changing and across industry, it's understandable return on investment is incredibly important. These kinds of technologies like the one you just described, what they do is actually show that the return on investment is there. If you make a sound decision and you invest appropriately, disruptive technology and agile business practices can actually transform and actually massively improve a business's bottom line. But industry has to have the confidence to go there. Um, can I ever talk to Pat Dennis actually talking about business confidence? Because as the hospitality person, I know you have a lot of really high personality, <laughs> very engaged staff working across your industry. Um, and I want to know what your best staff success story is when integrating new technology. Well, um, within the hospitality industry. Mm. Good question. I, th I think there hasn't, as far as robotics go, I haven't seen a to the trip. I haven't seen a lot of new technology come in recently. Um, okay. However, there are there are, I guess, if you look more broadly at that industry for there are success stories around the use of big data and being able to all, and be able to use that data. Uh, yeah. If you look at organisations such as Australian Tourism Data Warehouse and Tourism New Zealand, as, as far as being able to predict tourism trends, uh, we mm -hmm. can see 
overseas. Uh, there's a good success story with Barcelona City Council being able to uh, use technology to provide tourists with tailor-made routes and, and, and tourist attractions and offerings. So there's greater, I guess, application for that in Australia within the, the tourism industry itself. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and leading to things like self-guided tourism and real-time information. Probably yeah. the most evident that you've seen in automation in tourism recently in Australia would have to be uh, around customer service, so self-service check-in, which have been adopted for other industries itself. Mm, yeah, th these are all kind of falling into that big umbrella of smart cities technology. And there's a massive amount of capacity. I think when we consider the the usage of data to make not only tourist experience better, but local civic experience better as well. Um, and what's available in Barcelona, you know, there's some wonderful online um agencies which are promoted by the World Economic Forum, which are developing smart cities technology rollout. And I would be so interested to see how they would go in the Australian market. Um, I pointed out to hospitality in particular, just because I really feel that you know, there's a self-selection bias for people entering into different types of careers, that there's a very high engagement workforce sitting inside of hospitality. And I think that it's not just youth culture. I think that there's actually a huge engagement with the capacity for new types of technology and what they would be able to do. You know, it's not just about having a fancy bar robot. It's actually about the utility of providing better customer service. So I, agree. Mm, I think that's really true, Pat. You know, Robert, Robert Petheridge, um, when it comes to new technology being a success, what can you tell us, you know, coming out of uh, Queensland Future Skills at the moment? So I think successful implementation of new technology does come down to, uh, at the end of the day, um, very good change management. Now, mm -hmm. skills and workforce development is a really key part of that. Um, but just having the, you know, the training programs and those sorts of things available isn't going to be enough to actually transition the workforce. So. What or the approach that we're taking in the work that we're doing for BMA um, here in Queensland mm -hmm. is to look at the new technology and then look at the technical skills and work out from that work. What are the new skills? What are the new training programs, etc., that are required? And um, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly, um, all of those programs fall within the skills and the vet space. Um, mm -hmm. There are some, you know, higher education ones as well, but. Um, predominantly the, the new skills and new programs that are required are in the best case, which is why, you know, obviously this, this session is so important. But concurrently yes. with that, we're running um, what we um, have as a transformation working group as well. And the role of that group is to actually work with all the local stakeholders, everyone from local schools to um, the employers, to the equipment manufacturers, um, to local government authorities, etc and look at how we actually map and implement a good change management strategy, both within the existing employers um, and predominantly BMA, obviously, but also how we actually start to work with schools and people who are looking for work, et cetera, to you know, map career pathways and those sorts of things to, to come into the industry as well. So I think that implementation um, does require a very good change management and obviously skills and workforce development is a key part of that. So do you think that change management is almost the most important part of getting the success for any industry? Well, I think absolutely. Like if you take the example of, um, you know, the um, if you sort of Google or, you know, you ask anyone about automation, the first response is, oh, you know, automation there is going to take jobs, it's going to cost jobs, etc. Now, if you look at the reality and my understanding of the work that um, Rio Tinto have done um, over in WA and certainly the work that we've done here, um, there's actually more people required in an autonomous operation when you sort of map the end-to-end -end job requirements, etc. You actually need more people to, to run those operations. Um, they might be safer, they might be more efficient, they might be many things, but there's actually more people. So I think working with people, um, debunking some of those common myths and then actually you know, laying out a clear roadmap a fair way in advance of you know what change is, what what the impact of those individuals is going to be, what support they're going to be provided with, and then the benefits of it all overall is really really important. So yeah, I, I would agree with that premise. That change management is a really really key part of it. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense, Robert. 
Um, Brett Dale, if I can throw over to you for just a moment. Uh, we just had Robert reflecting on the idea of change management as being an important part of upskilling uh, at the level of actually delivering outcomes for industry. Brett, what do you think makes the most, you know, probably important element when it comes to succeeding introduce, when we introduce robotics and technology into your industry? Yeah, so I think the biggest challenge, certainly leading it through appropriate change management strategies is key, but certainly having a workforce that's resilient and subject and used to uh, change is key. So, you know, I think one of the, when we talk about uh, the foundations of uh, education and training, we used to talk about literacy and numeracy. I think there's almost a need to go back to grassroots and think about resilience and change because the, the way in which um, technology is evolving is so rapid that the trade in which you enter and the trade in which you exit will be very different over the years. And it's being having the capacity to respond, so equally leading that change management, but being a learner who's uh, receptive to it. And we need to start that at grassroots. That's a, that's a big challenge, and I think that will determine the success. If I think about my industry, we're an industry that's very successful based on the fact that um, mobility is almost like water and food. We need it to do everything. We've become mm. so dependent on cars and trucks to get anywhere and to enable supply chain. So being successful in business was was almost a given. Now, with the amount of change that's coming and technology, the way I've had to stimulate the interest of business to get them ready but to transition to new business models is to act as an agitator, to talk about the disruptions that may occur, that may be a threat or may be an opportunity. Uh, and originally, that was uh, that was really challenging for my members and the industry as a whole. In fact, I think I thought I was mad four years ago when I started doing that uh, because it seemed like a voice against them, but I knew it was inevitable technology and that agitation really worked. So I think we've got a much more future-focused industry as a result, and we established uh, Australia's first automotive innovation hub as a result of that. And we contemplate and bring in new players, um, but we spread that message to the whole of industry to spark up their competitive nature. And it, that agitation works really, really well for me personally mm. and for our industry. Oh, that was great. Yeah, I like, you know, let's agitate everyone. That's fantastic. Because when it comes down to it, there's a lot of slow moving. You know, as Sue said right at the beginning before we got into our panel discussion today, there's a massive opportunity sitting here in terms of what we can do as industry and then there's what's actually happening. And we probably need more agitators out there to try and see what we can do to coordinate, you know, from the top down and from the bottom up and meet somewhere in the middle in terms of having that excellent outlay of the, the capacity for Australian industry to really make a difference. Uh, you know, not just on the global sector, but for me, it's really, you know, what are we doing to provide better systems and better products for Australians as well? What's happening with our local market? Um, we're almost out of time for our 60 minutes, so I'm actually going to throw it open a little bit. I have one more question, and whoever wants to answer it, you can have a, have a go, because we all have to learn from our mistakes. Like, this is a good question. Do you have any stories of staff training? in the age of automation where it just went wrong? Who can tell me when it went badly? Does anyone want to put their hands up? <laughs> no? I only had one experience um, that I could probably pick up that was a very obvious one and it sounds crazy, but we went live with a robotic system in a nursing home that the uh, super users did not complete the training on all staff. So we had the robots um, for a number of months moving around where the staff were not uh, trained and the system completely uh, got to a point where it wasn't working. So um, my advice is don't go live um, until everyone has been ticked off and signed off. And that commitment came from the, the management at that time was not there. So um, CEO purchased, uh, super users trained, but nobody else trained didn't work. So you need to have everyone on the floor from top to bottom trained. And um, and unfortunately, a couple of months down the track, we've had to mop up that mess and try and get it back to working again. And 
and we're heading down the right track now. So yeah. oh, I'm, I'm glad you had an excellent outcome. Uh, the, the hard part, isn't it, when we're trying to introduce something as complicated as, you know, new technology, which requires specific ways of working, changing the way that people are interacting with the technology and the services that they're providing, it can go wrong. And the reality is that then we, as a collective, you know, we sort of sit and look at our colleagues and say, how do we learn from our mistakes? How do we actually make this from a negative to a positive? And it sounds as though Lamson is working hard to turn this ship around. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I agree with that. Don't roll things out until everyone's ready. No, don't don't take the you know if they pressure you, but you need to say no. Nope, that's stick to your guns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say this is exactly the same. Stick to your guns, Leonie. That's exactly right. Look, you know, I think that's probably enough from our set questions. I have been, uh, no doubt, you might have heard a few uh, announcement sounds. That's every time that happens, I'm getting about five community questions being put forward from the WebEx. Um, so we now have about half an hour in front of us where we're going to sit down and actually look at what is happening for the people who are registered today. They have provided a number of questions with regards to sometimes specific points that you as the panel have made or sometimes just general questions. Um, so I'd like to first of all say thank you very much for the last hour of your time. That was brilliant. I really enjoyed your points and we had some really pertinent excellent notations made there um, with regards particularly to training, availability, the way that agencies work at different levels, supply chain. I really enjoyed that. That was wonderful. So thank you for that. But we still have another half an hour. <laughs> so have a drink of water, have a coffee. Um, and I'm going to ask my first question to Scott. Scott White, I have a question for you. How do you incentivize students to learn skills that are going to be redundant in time versus the cutting edge skills? Yeah, that, that is a tricky one. And, and I've experienced this a couple of times over the years where you have employed, particularly software engineers, who come out wanting to use the latest and greatest and want to work for Google and so forth. but they're working on a, on, a, on a particular defense aircraft that might be 20 years old, 30 years old, uh, and using software language that, that, that's old. So you know, there's a big gap in expectations. I want to, I've been trained to do the latest and greatest. I want to do that. I want to be there on the cutting edge. Um, because there are elements of that. There are pockets within industry that are doing that, and, and particularly mm -hmm. that's where we rely on the SMEs more so because the, the large companies are, a lot, um, I guess, more... Uh, slower to move and, and have a certain momentum in a direction. Um, and you want them to then apply their knowledge and expertise, but in somewhat an older technology. So it's, it's, it's a real, yeah. real challenge. And, and, and preparing them, I guess, for that, working with the institutions, the universities and TAFEs, just to make sure that there is that bit of a reality check. Yes, it's yeah. great. You know, we need to be leaning forward, but then there's also the real world. Otherwise, there's a bit of a, a shock when they come and, and go, oh, you're not doing what I've been taught. You know, it's, so that's where we work closely with the schools, work closely with the universities, give work experience opportunities and, uh, and different other sort of programs. And, and, it's, and you know, Airbus is involved in a number of programs to try and make sure that, that not only are they getting an intellectual learning, but also an experiential learning. That also mm -hmm. helps develop mm -hmm. the real world skills, the transferable skills that they need. And that's one of the one of the things that aerospace needs is yes, we need very smart people, we need new technology, but we need people who can work in a team, we need people who can think critically about problems and mm -hmm. importantly focus on the end customer who's the yeah. one who's need. It's all of those characteristics that make for uh, someone who's an excellent add to the workforce. And, you know, this question of timeliness of training, I don't think it's going to go away. I think that as we find ourselves increasingly facing, you know, new ways of doing things and new ways of interacting with technology, how skills are going to be best, you know, dealt with either through training or through industry, this question is going to come up again and again in terms of, of the best way to go about it. Um, that question was particularly directed to Scott, but as he was talking, some of you might have had some ideas 
about what you would think about in terms of timeliness of training and training delivery. Does anyone want to add to Scott's point? Amanda, it's uh, Robert Petherbridge here. I'm, Hi, Robert. Yeah, yeah, you Hello. Um, so the, what I'd add to that is I think that um, what that leads directly to is, is, is the type of training. So traditionally, um, you know, universities and, you know, the TAFE sector, the apprenticeship centre, sector have looked at um, providing a full qualification at the start um, of someone's career um, and with the expectation that that's you know the majority of um, the need in the market or the workforce what we did um, you know going back to I think it was about 2016 was the first bit of work we did with CSIRO looking at you know what does a workforce of the future need etc and that research showed us very very clearly that the um, which we've seen roll out in the last year which is you know quite positive that the um, increasing importance of micro learning, micro credential skill sets. So people can, you know, learn something, be it either on newer technology or older technology, but then pick up the bits that they need along the way um, is, you know, is I think very important to the to the future world of work. The yeah, trick is yeah. how you actually credential that and how we, we and I don't think we've got that system right yet in terms of how you, you know, package that all together, you give, you know, someone the credentials that, that they can then stack and then take from place to place. But that's probably my takeaway from it. Yeah, I think that what micro credentials are going to offer the workforce is something that could be revolutionary in that you can component build your own degree and it can be tailored to the work that you're actually doing. Given that we're asking people probably to be more engaged in their vocational training from both um, uh, a train from both a skills perspective and a doing perspective you know this idea of learning as you go is going to change the way that education is delivered and you know there's some big questions here I don't know if anyone's really answered them from uh, you know internationally from a delivery perspective yet and that's why we're really looking for those case examples to see how actually do educators step up and step into a training space when everything is so bespoke, it's so customised, it's all about what that actual trainee's experience is and where their skills need to be going to do the job that they particularly are engaged in. Um, yeah, it's a big one. So it's about technology and it's also about, um, you know, the ability for trainers to be able to meet the needs of the students. Um, okay, I'm going to, because I don't want to spend all of our time just on, on Scott's question. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to ask a question. This one's from Colin Thomas. So thank you, Colin. Um, Colin says, my estimate is that about 90% of the robot systems capability in South Australia is embedded in employees working for manufacturers, probably lots of roboticists in non-manufacturing. How do manufacturers bring those skills into the workplace? So Tim and Corey, I'm looking particularly at you. How do manufacturers bring robotic skills into the workplace? Uh, I'll give it a go, for Tim, and then I'll, I'll, I would love for you to add value. Um, in many ways, that's what we're, we're doing in a day to day operations here at the Arm Hub. We're, we're taking, um, going into companies, um, asking about what their challenges are trying to consider how we can support them. And often they think they have a perhaps a robotic challenge or, or a, a series of robotic challenges, and sometimes they don't. Um, what I find really valuable about um, having highly skilled and capable roboticists, which um, you know many of you know on this panel, um, is um, go and spend time with companies as they have a different way of looking at things quite often and um, you know really cutting through what's what's actually the opportunity, what's required, and you know what kind of um, digital transformation is is likely to be most useful. Um, so, from that point, just ha spending spending time with roboticists, and then um, sometimes, you know, a good scenario might be that they they employ a roboticist or a, a megatronics engineer, or that uh, ultimately perhaps did some project work with them. Um, but like we've been talking about in terms of skills. Typically, what's happened is that they're actually training up their own staff to be those roboticists at various levels and sometimes incredibly confident levels. So 
really skills transformation is the biggest story that I, I can I can say. So different companies have different strategies about how to get roboticists in. I mean, collaborate, do an R&D project or get new highly skilled um, graduates and train them up specifically, um, uh, kind of, um, can, I guess, perhaps even just purchase a whole new company. Um, there's, there's many ways to get robotic skills into your to workforce that I've seen. Um, but the best opportunity, I think, is always to really be open to collaboration. I know I've said it before, but that's, that's what's um, key. No, that's, that's really true. I love that skills transformation. Um, Tim, can I bounce over to you? What do you think, you know, in terms of the, the same question that Corey just fielded? How do we get manufacturers to bring robotic skills into the workplace? Yeah, great question. Uh, for, for us, uh, we have a couple of things that, that sort of drive us uh, to bring those skills in. One of those is the fact that we, we recognise that we need uh, robotics and automation more into our plants. And there's two things that drive, or well, there's three things actually that drive that. The first is the, the level of innovation in the product and the package that the consumer is asking for. It's more complicated, it's more varied than it's ever been before. And so that level of competition drives us to look for new ways to do that rather than using people. And so then we're, we're looking for, for that. Another one that drives it is capacity. And so we need to be able to make more biscuits every hour of the day to be able to service the market so we can grow the company so that we don't have to run longer hours or invest in more factories. We want to keep our footprint the same, uh, but we want to make more biscuits every hour of the day. Uh, we already run most of the week anyway. So what we're also doing is we're looking for operational improvement and that, that keeps our competitiveness. So those things drive the need to increase our level of automation. What we do then is uh, recognising that we have a need, we then go out and solve the problem. So what is the way that we can deal with innovation in our product or package? What is the way that we can unlock capacity? What is the way that we can get operational improvement? And what we do is we use lean tools and, and other facilita facilitated processes to identify those things. Once we've identified it, the root cause of our problem or our opportunity, we then engage uh, appropriate suppliers or we have an internal team of engineers and robotic specialists who help us, and then they come up with solutions. So sometimes internal, sometimes external, uh, and that's how we get the skills in. But it's based on we recognise the first step is we recognise that there's a need there. Once we recognise it, then we go about solving it in different ways, and that brings the skills in naturally into, into our manufacturing to remain competitive and, and ultimately keep manufacturing here in Australia versus uh, a lot of our competition that's coming in from overseas. That organic process of training, use and development makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and what I'm hearing is that, you know, we have some really highly qualified STEM graduates and they're doing excellently and I really wish the world for them and their career development. But we also have a lot of people on the floor who have capacity and interest in developing their skill set. And when we have that capacity and we have that engagement, and it's like you said, how many biscuits can I get out of the door in the same amount of time? It's a good question. You know, these are the guys who are actually, and girls, who are actually really heavily invested in, you know, finding out what the answer to that question is. And you know what? They have the ability to upskill. You know, it's this idea of what's coming from top down with graduates, and then there's what's coming from bottom up with factory floor workers or similar, maybe from hospitality, for example, where people don't necessarily have a high education background, but they have a high capacity for service delivery and for product delivery when they're trained appropriately. So, yeah, I, yeah, I, think, um, yes. I think Tim mentioned something um, really worthwhile just picking up on um, that, that productivity question. Yes, Corey. Um, and given that, you know, you know, manufacturing, which is the other kind of dimension um, that Tim's engaged in there, has really dealt with it's going through an unprecedented time of um, transformation and opportunity, given COVID, um, sort of their sovereign kind of claims. Um, really what's driving that is a sense of um, what, what resilience will look like and what ongoing competitiveness will look like. And that is about really making sure we can compete on um, productivity levels. So, you know, teams set out the equation. And the only way the nation can do that 
is by you know adopting industry four, of which of course robotics is such a significant component. And I know we we'll talk about this in the the manufacturing kind of um, section too, but there's terrific overlap and that sort of um, urgency, um, the sort of focus that is now is a great time in which to really be thinking about the skills and um, how to get them in many different modes, perhaps even at once. So, you know, mm. working, training, um, applying it on the floor. I think businesses are more open to it now, perhaps than ever before. And I think there's resources perhaps available to support that. So, you know, seize the moment. <laughs> Absolutely, Corey. I do think we should seize the moment. That was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask the next question, and it's from Sharon Singh. Hi, Sharon. Um, Sharon is interested in robotics resources. She says, robotics resources are quite expensive for schools here in Australia. Is there any support from organisations or industry to provide support in this area? The learning needs to take place in our schools. Many a time, it is the cost of the resources that inhibit it. Um, Brett Hagsma, can I throw that out to you, even though it's not necessarily uh, schools that you're working with, but can you give us an idea about um, access to resources, please? I will do my best. Thank you, Amanda. Um, in that space, I'd be thinking of things like the Gateway Industry Schools programs. Um, there is some in manufacturing and aerospace. Um, and there's good success where you can actually um, create meaningful partnerships between schools and industry. Um, what we find is if there are jobs around a school, it's in the school's interest to be able to transition students out into those industries. It's a good outcome for everyone. It's a good outcome for the community, the schools and the participants. So if local industry can see the benefit in that and be able to either um, you know, provide equipment to schools or support to get that equipment. It benefits both parties. So the, my best answer at this stage would be the gateway to industry programs and building on that type of activity um, and locally looking at what's available around local schools where they could mm. partner with industry to get some of that equipment. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. Um, can, can I just ask anyone else here if they have any points of relevance? with regards to education access inside of primary schools or high school environments? It's okay if, if that was, it. GISP is really, I think, a very high value uh, program for, for Queensland. Yeah, it's Scott here um, from Airbus. So certainly Airbus has a lot of, lot of material online, um, so it's easy to Google, and there's a lot of information there about STEM and about aerospace and um, for schools, for both schools and for the students themselves. So there, are, I say, there's a number of free resources there and videos and learning packages. Um, what we also do locally, and I, I'm sort of hesitant to say this because I don't want to create demand, but um, we we do have a a, a program that we've run in a few schools that uh, it's a little engineers program and looks at coding, creating a, a Lego robot um, and round mm -hmm. space and uh, it's about a four hour long session and uh, so it, it's run by our own internal engineers at this point in time so it, it's rather limited in terms of what we can provide mm -hmm. but, it, but it's certainly about trying to engage you know, industry to the students and create that passion and interest to set the students on a path um, down the STEM pathway. Yeah. Yeah, and like that, that's some really good points. And as you were speaking, I was just thinking, you know, in the last few years, freelance robotics has been relatively active in RoboCup Juniors, where we've been able to see, you know, the students in particularly secondary education coming forward and demonstrating the work that they've done. But always in the back of my mind when I'm attending these sorts of education opportunities is equity. You know, just like you mentioned, what you can do is relatively small scale. I can understand you don't want to have 500 applications for what your little engineers program is capable of doing because it sounds amazing, but there is equity issues. And when we have students from regional parts of Australia who are already struggling to have equity inside of education, when we start to throw advanced technology on top of that, I agree that there can be some real barriers between them and the sort of learning that we're talking about here for younger people. 
and certainly I think all of the states and territories are going to have a big question on their table, which is how do we get technology out there? It's not just about providing a drone or, you know, some extra laptops. It's actually about the sort of work that you're talking through, Scott. You know, it's about um, what's happening inside of industry. It's about tailoring that education system and having the teachers competent and ready to deliver what the students will be asking them to deliver for their regional teams and their regional towns. Yeah. That's a good point. So thank you, Sharon. That was a nice question. I'm going to move on. Um, uh, this is a TAFE question or university question. Um, and the question is, uh, is robot programming part of any current TAFE or university qualification? Where is robot programming combined with machine design? And that's from Colin. It's, uh, it's Robert here. I'll have a go at that one. But I might call on Jackie to, to supplement where I uh, where I, uh, don't get it wrong because this is in fact Jackie's <laughs> area. Um, certainly, in terms of you know robot programming and robotics, etc., that's an area that we've been looking at significantly. Um, we've um, over the last year or so, we've actually purchased robots and um, had code gone ahead this year. We had intended to have um, some little robots that were nicely wrapped walking around, um, talking to people about the sorts of work and the sorts of programs that we run for our students. And we've also, um, in the not too recent future, um, um, uh, past I should say, uh, started working with Central Queensland University to look at how we actually build a combined, you know, a, a pathway if you like, that goes from a vocational qualification <coughs> in robotics and robot programming into um, a higher ed program as well. So it's certainly something that's on our radar and we've been doing a lot of work with the university sector as well as CSIRO. Um, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Jackie? Um, I'm not sure if I can pick you there. Oh, yeah, I am. Yeah, and no, I think you said it quite well. I think um, uh, we are working with CQU, CSIRO, and the robots actually came from Freelance Robotics. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go team, go team. Yeah. Um, because uh, th this is actually a really useful concept in terms of getting skills out from, you know, academic or high level graduates and into real world usage. How do we think about the people who need these skills now? And the robots need to get out there, the technology needs to get out there. And it's true, you know, what Jackie just said is the in amount of work that's taking place to support students to have better opportunities for engagement um, because they're already working full-time or part-time is actually um, quite considerable and I'm looking forward to the next five years because I think we're going to have some very interesting rollouts when it comes to uh, say for instance technician or advanced robot um, type programming certificates that people might find applicable to work that they would be doing in manufacturing or hospitality or, or similar service-based industries. Yeah. So thank you. Um, I might ask the next question, and this is a general question. The question is from Kate. Hi, Kate. Thanks for coming to our webinar today. Um, the question is, as industry leaders, how do you envision the ideal employee of the future? That is, which skills and characteristics would you like to see in five to ten years' time? And um, I think I might throw that one out to Leonie. Leonie, who's your ideal employee? Oh, that's a very good question. I think it's open-minded so that when they come to work, that they are um, able to work across all different avenues in a business and not be so siloed into one area of a business uh, or one job. And I only do one thing um, because then they can not only um, I guess ultimately improve their skills in other things, but also allow the robots to do the mundane thing that crosses over different parts of the business. So, I think probably the ideal would be a, a customer, a, sorry, a staff member who has, when you're employing and doing those interviews, has that flexibility to to um, uh, look across the whole of the business and have that optimism and also uh, open mindedness to actually work in a number of different ways. That makes a lot of sense, Leonie. And what's your opinion, Brett? I'll throw that to Brett Dale. Can you give a follow-up to Leonie's idea of what the, you know, the key aspects are for the staff member of the future in the motor industry? Absolutely. I think, well, what is essential today and even more essential in the future, will they'll need to be tech savvy, they'll need to be responsive to change. 
Um, but I think more than anything, um, I think they do need to be open to knowing that the job in which they start is going to change. And this is that grassroots stuff that we need to be talking. And getting that technology into schools, which was raised earlier, is just key to that. We have attempted to run a number of innovation symposiums where we get all the startups to put their equipment on display. And even though we do that from a commercial perspective to look at investors going into that technology, we also open it up to schools to be exposed to that. And I think it starts there. And I think, you know, to be fair, the younger generation are much more um, tech savvy. For us, industry has been challenged with a skill shortage. The um, laborious type tasks that were traditionally associated with our trades weren't appealing. So this evolution of technology and automation is a great thing for us. We have coders thinking about being technicians in our industry and, and gamers, and that's great news for us. It aligns with the next generation for the workforce. Mm, mm. And that's that tech savvy uh, that I think is essential. Tech savvy. Is that in your mind too, Pat? Pat Dennis? Tell me, what's your ideal employee of five to ten years' time for your industry? Are they tech savvy too? Yeah, I think they are, and I think it's been touched on already with words such as uh, resilient, responsive, flexible, open-minded. Um, mm, yeah. One of the challenges faced by our industry, and it's even in the next five years across Australia, is we're looking at a shortage of just in the kitchen, in the back end of, a, of hospitality, 40,000 people. Uh, and so technology certainly has the opportunity to address that shortage. Um, there's been discussions for many years over the shortage of apprentice chefs, and um, it was just touched on then. It's um, it's not an interest. It, it's an interest. It's an industry that's an apprentice-based pathway that's lost its appeal over time. Uh, mm. And there's certainly a number of skills within that trade that could be mechanised and. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, Look, I'm going to ask just one final question. Thanks, Brett. That was a really good point. Um, sorry, Pat. It was a good point with, with 90 minutes in my poor brain. Okay, one final question. And, Pat, we can start even with you. This workshop has exposed a very big hole in my robotics knowledge, that of technology introduction and change management. Any reading recommendations? And this question was from Julian Grodzicki. So Julian's asking, do you have any reading recommendations for someone who wants to know more about robotics in your industry? Well, that's a good that's a good plug for your for the robotic robotics roadmap, right? Um, ah, true. <laughs> if you do actually work your way, and if you do actually work your way through the uh, the page that's been put up for this webinar, there are many good presenters, and there is reference to a lot of good literature. Uh, so I would start. I would start with that to get, yeah, you know, to uh, to get your head around where the future's going. Thanks, Pat. That's lovely. That's lovely. Who else has an idea? What's your top read? Does anyone have a good uh, suggestion of a of a book for someone wanting to know more? Or if not a book, maybe just a resource, because we're all digital these days anyway. Yeah, just one more thing, Amanda, if you want to look more broadly than just robotics and look at Industry 4 and, and look at what the future of work is, you know, there's some there's some great works by um, some of the people that come from outside of the robotics area, economists like um, Maria, uh, Mariana Mazzucato and Robert Reich, who have been writing for like five to ten years around um, how industries are going to change and, and how important mm -hmm. um, being able to, to, to process uh, and have digital skills and and to and to work in those areas how that is the future so they've been calling it out for a long time yes it's that's a really really good point um if you don't mind some government-based literature there's certainly been a lot of uh investment that's come from government think tanks or associated departments where they've sat down and actually put together not a roadmap per se, but at least some plans for what different industries need to be doing to address the introduction of automation to their workforce. Um, those are certainly worth looking up. And then, yes, you're very true what you're saying. It's those big umbrella concepts. Um, economists are doing a really good job of looking at it. I'm also particularly interested um, from a generalist perspective of what this means in terms of society. So we're going to have to start thinking about smart cities, about different ways that we have ethics 
for policy and policy rollout and what the everyday consumer actually wants from our robotic and automation changes. You know, we're all in the process of continuously readjusting, you know, where our society is going and what we want from the technology that's available to us. And having a look at what's available, not just in terms of print media, but also going out and seeing what you can find in terms of uh, resources, forums, um, and what else is online can actually be very useful as well. Um, I'm going to wrap it up pretty soon, but I really loved that question. Does anyone else have a final thought or something they would like to add that maybe is very important that we get across today before we finalise? A reinforcement one from me, Amanda. It's Robert Petherbridge. I think, Hi, I think Robert. just having this, having the focus on a skills chapter and recognising the really important role of, you know, vocational education and training as part of a, um, a continuum, if you like, of skills. And you know, certainly in all the work that that I do, the the training sector, the skilling sector is very, very important, but a lot of the time gets overlooked for, you know, sort of university partners, etc. That's not to suggest that universities and everything don't have a role to play. And I think Brett probably summed it up really well before in one of his comments, um, which was, you know, around lifelong learning and moving between vocational and higher education pathways. There's a real need for, you know, for each of the sectors in those pathways. So congratulations um, for everyone who got the, um, you know, the skills chapter on the table. I think it's um, a very important piece of work. Thank you, Robert. I completely agree with what you've said. You know, we need to have some really strong direction coming into the next, say, five to ten years so that we can plan a better workforce and to take really a hands-on approach to this opportunity that's being put in front of us. Um, does anyone else have a final thought that they'd like to add? I have Sally here. I'm wondering if I could make a final comment. Yes, please. They're asking about things to read, and I think one of the problems that we face in robotics is people often focus in on the technology and the training, but also the, I think one of the biggest the fundamental challenges is around culture, is around understanding uh, what a robot can do and what it can do for you. And so many cases, we had this in the defence workshop, is there's a crisis of imagination about what robots can offer us, humanity can offer humanity. And often it's about the fact that a robot can do work for you, right? It can act with you and as a partner, rather than just thinking about the technology, but thinking about the role that a robot can play in society. I think that's going to be a very interesting conversation for people. And something, if you look at Industry 4, the fundamental point behind Industry 4 is not the technology. What it is, is the principles of Industry 4. And Industry 4 principles are around open transparency and distributed decision making. So it's that thing that we really need to, that's something that people need to understand. It's, it's a, you can have the technology, you can have the capability, but you have to have the insight and the culture to actually adopt that technology. Mm, beautiful. I think that was a really excellent sum up point, Elliot. I completely concur with that. And on that note, I think we're going to say thank you to all of our panelists today. It was really a pleasure to sit with you over the course of the last 90 minutes and have this conversation. And I really encourage everyone who was able to participate as a registrant in today's workshop to follow up and to take some note of the work that was submitted, um, for instance, in terms of videos, or if you have anything further that you would like to raise, uh, by all means, continue utilising the Miro uh, work board. My understanding is it's going to be up for quite some time and it might be the case that our wonderful panellists from today might drop in and even have a look at what it is that you've had to say there. Um, so once again, thank you all for your time. I think I'm going to hand it back to Sue. Um, it was a complete pleasure. Thanks very much, Amanda. And you did such a great job uh, fielding all the questions and, um, and making sure all of the panellists were involved so we could hear so many different perspectives. The next steps, as Amanda has previewed, are that our Miro board will remain open and so you'll have the opportunity, if you would like, to comment on where the skill gaps are in different sectors. So we have a board on manufacturing, mining, health, aerospace, services, government, hospitality, education and defence. Uh, so please feel free to participate and put um, uh, your thoughts up on those boards. 
As I mentioned at the start of the presentation, we also are running a survey, and so you are able to contribute to the roadmap by completing that survey. Um, the next steps from here are that the um, co-chairs for today's workshop will be undergoing the tough work of actually putting that chapter together. Uh, so we hope to have all of the chapters finished uh, near the end of this year so that we can produce a new version of the roadmap. Um, so look out for when that happens. So just to finish, I'd like to thank our co-chairs for today, uh, Jackie French, uh, Reza Ryan from TAFE, um, Pretty Pritachandra from Central Queensland University, William Pagnon from Freelance Robotics, our fabulous moderator today, Amanda White from Freelance Robotics, uh, and uh, Elliot Duff from CSIRO and Andrew Scott from the Queensland Robotics Cluster have been busy in the background, um, beavering away on the Miro boards there with, with William. So thank you for your help. And uh, please, uh, well, I get you to join me, but we won't actually be able to hear your applause. But uh, just if you can please give everyone a mental clap um, for all of our industry panellists for giving up their time today. So Robert Petherbridge from the Future Skills Group, Corey Stewart from the Advanced Robotics Manufacturing Hub, Leonie Mulheron from Lamps and Concepts, Tim Morgan from Arnott's Biscuits, Scott White from Airbus, Brett Hagsma from DSBT, Pat Dennis from TAFE, and Brett Dale from Motor Traders Association Queensland, MTAQ. Thank you, everyone. And uh, yes, please keep in the loop. Um, you can find out more information by following the Robotics Australia Network website. Um, there are more workshops coming up. So our trust and safety workshop is on Tuesday. You can still register for that. And uh, the other workshops, we're experimenting with all sorts of different formats. So it will be a completely mixed bag if you, you decide to register and turn up for one of those in the future. But thank you again to my co-chairs and to our panellists and uh, especially to our audience today. Thank you for joining us.